people. Hi, uh, my name is Kat Tamajan. Um, this is my first open source bridge. Uh, so I'm kind of excited to be here. Actually, I'm really excited to be here. So. Um, so just a quick word before we get started. I'm presenting primarily for projects that have an existing user base but are having trouble getting volunteers or retaining volunteers. Um, other folks can listen in, but that's more the audience that I'm aiming at. Um, also, I will take questions at the end. Uh, so if you have a question, write it down. Because if you interrupt me, I will lose my train of thought, and then I will be very sad. <laughs> so about me. So my name is Kat Tamajan, as I said. Um, I'm known as Zarhui on most of the internet. My staff account on DreamWith is Miss Kat. Um, I work for DreamWit Studios from our little blurb on the website. DreamWit Studios is an independent community-based blogging platform that believes in privacy, accessibility, diversity, and freedom. So that's, that's DreamWit in like a little sentence blurb right there. Uh, we forked from the LiveJournal code base in 2008. We have approximately a quarter of a million lines of code. Uh, we're co-owned by Denise Palucci and Mark Smith. And we have about 50 to 60 active volunteers across the site in various uh, parts of the, the project. About two thirds of those volunteers are women and about 65% of those people have never coded before they joined DreamWith. So my actual job is community and volunteer support and documentation. Uh, basically that means I interface between the users and the developers. I point out bugs, I handle a lot of the end user documentation, I handhold for new volunteers and I manage my community. I'm in IRC a lot, um, I answer questions, I'm a friendly face, I'm somebody that people can point to and say, hey, you can go ask Kat, she'll probably know the answer. Whether that's true or not, I might know where to find the answer, so that's more important. As far as experience goes, I have uh, 15 years of experience with various nonprofit organizations, five years in nonprofit uh, volunteer management, and with open source, I have about four years, primarily with DreamWith. I've been the co-lead of support for three and a half years, and then I got hired in January. Um, I've also advised for the archive of our own on their support system, and I'm a regular user of that project, and I'm peripherally involved with growstuff.org. I'd really like to do more, but unfortunately, I don't have enough hours in the day. <laughs> so. so why am I giving this talk? And more importantly, why are you here? General perceptions about open source communities uh, which discourage new volunteers are the gender disparity. Uh, according to uh, some research done on the Geek Feminism Wiki, 25% uh, of women, or sorry, 25% of the people in tech are women, but only 1.5% of those women are in open source. There's a huge disparity there. So let's take a look at why. Um, so, you know, a gender disparity is probably an accurate perception from an outsider's point of view. There's also a perception that the open source community is hostile to newcomers. They might not be actively hostile, but they might just have really high barriers to entry, and they might not know what to do with inexperienced volunteers who haven't had experience with a previous project. There's also a perception that you need to already have experience to get experience, that people are only looking for rock star programmers and average developers need not apply. And finally, there's also a perception of an interview process that the project is interviewing the volunteer to see if they're good enough to join the project. Actually, it's exactly the reverse that's true. Your volunteer is interviewing you to see if they want to spend their time with you. So just keep that in mind. Your project is usually not a special snowflake. There's a lot of projects out there, so making yours stand out in the crowd is really super important. So when a new volunteer checks in uh, to your project to look around, they might be looking at culture, environment, what other people are there, um, or just about anything else. They could be looking at accessibility, what you use on the back end, who knows. And what do they want to accomplish? Again, this varies by person and might even vary by project. So do they want to give back to the community? Do they want to fix that one bug that's been driving them nuts for four and a half years? oh my gosh, I can't stand it anymore, I'm gonna go figure out how to hack this and get it fixed, which that's probably about how three-fourths of our volunteers got started. Um, or do they just wanna gain experience? Do they wanna learn how to code? Or is it anything else? Uh, there's as many people as there are in the world, there are that many number of reasons why people might wanna hack on your project. So how do you get people's attention? How do you get them to look at your project and decide, hey, yeah, I totally wanna to go over there? The first thing, be nice. I mean. Just be nice. Don't have rude things in your IRC channel. Try to be at least PG-13. And what that PG-13 looks like is gonna vary from project to project, but just keep an eye on it. Um, if people are saying that this topic makes them really uncomfortable, why don't you review why it's making them uncomfortable or what you can do to change that culture so that that topic doesn't come up as much. Um, also, community behavior standards can self-enforce. So if you make it socially unacceptable for X to happen, X is gonna happen left off, less often. 
when you're initially starting with your project, having a really strong community standard and enforcing it regularly will make that self-perpetuating in both ways. So take a look at your culture and just review how that's going. It's also really important to argue constructively. I'm certainly not saying that you can't have disagreements about how things are gonna work because really that's how development happens. But there's a difference between collaborative development and combative development. So it's okay to argue about stuff, but argue about the thing, not about the person. Don't do personal attacks. And at the end of the day, be able to go out and have a beer with the person that you were just arguing with. Um, in our channel, there's certain things that we just don't discuss at all. We don't discuss politics or religion ever. And if those topics come up, they get shunted off elsewhere where it's not an official channel because we just, as a culture, we've decided not to talk about those things. Um, and yeah, arguing constructively uh, can also in, give the impression that your project is not stable. So if you're arguing about something and you're arguing violently about it, they might be like, okay, well, they obviously can't agree on this one thing. What else is there that I'm not seeing that they're not disagreeing on or that they're not agreeing on? And they'll wander off and they won't come back. So be inclusive. Um, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but don't talk smack about people or the things that they've created. Uh, there's a difference between this sucks, I'm rejecting it, and you know, your patch is really appreciated. I'm really thankful that you took the time to go through this. There's this one little part here that doesn't quite conform to our style guidelines. Here's a link. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me back. I'd be more than happy to answer your questions. I really look forward to receiving a resubmission and giving them the indication that you actually do want to hear what they have to say. That will go leaps and bounds. Um, also, woman is not a four-letter word and neither is diversity. So don't use ableist jokes, don't make racist jokes, don't discriminate somebody against somebody because of their gender, sexual orientation, race, disability, coding ability, or any one of any number of things. So don't make sexist jokes, they're really not funny. Don't make racist jokes because they're really not funny. They're gonna drive people off your project and you won't see them again. Um, something that Hacker School does that I think is really interesting is they forbid the use of false surprise and well actually statements. So false surprise is, what do you mean you don't know what a pull request is? I mean, they just said they don't know what a pull request is. Instead of making them feel stupid for not understanding what this so-called basic concept is, why don't you just take five minutes and explain it to them? Uh, well, actually, statements are the, the worst form of bike shedding that I can possibly imagine. So that shirt is purple. No, that shirt's magenta. It doesn't matter. That shirt is not green. Like, that is the most important part there. So. If people are just giving a high-level overview, that's okay. And try not to dig too deep into that. Um, let me Google that for you and read the manual, or did you actually look at the documentation? Again, those things aren't really helpful. They're not constructive. Just help, be nice, don't be a jerk about stuff. Finally, if you hurt somebody's feelings, just apologize. Uh, say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings, and what can I do to not do that again in the future? or look at that yourself and see what you think you could do to not do that again in the future. Um, telling them to, that they have thin skin or that they should you know, suck it up and deal with it, again, it's not constructive, so just knock it off. So we've covered being nice, so let's cover being welcoming. The easiest way to be welcoming is to lower the entry barrier. So make it really easy to get involved and invested in your community. The catchphrase of our IRC channel is beware, you will be welcomed. Uh, we have a standard set of welcoming URLs designed to give a crash course in not only our development culture, but also our community culture. They include, excuse me, they include links to the QDB, our quotes database from IRC, our wiki, our bugzilla, um, common terminology glossary, GitHub, a couple other places. It's really important to document that culture as well as your development process because if somebody understands the in-jokes in your culture and in your community, they're gonna feel more invested. It's, it's just a really easy way to get people feeling involved when they can laugh at the same things that everyone else is laughing at. So document those things. Have somebody take point on that and make sure that you're documenting where these in-jokes come from so people can understand what's going on. So if you lower that entry barrier, you get more developers, which means more work or less work for you in the long run, which is definitely a positive. So follow the yellow brick code. Okay, I think that's hilarious. <laughs> so I don't know what you people aren't laughing at. <laughs> So, okay, follow the yellow brick code. Uh, the easiest way to get people involved is to let them know that you want them to get involved. 
So you put up a wanted sign in your window or on your news post or on your splash page saying, hey, we want people to do stuff. Not necessarily we want people to develop or we want awesome people because those can be off-putting in different ways. I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but we just want people to do stuff. Um, so if they don't know that you're looking, they won't know to go looking. With nonprofit organizations, they often recruit from, recruit from within. They have a captive audience. Um, like for example, the Girl Scouts, if you have a kid in Girl Scouts, chances are you're gonna get hit up at least once a month to go and lead something or other. And that's a way to get people more involved in your project. Um, and those type of people come preloaded with a sense of involvement. So if you recruit from your user base, those are people who already have some sort of emotional attachment to your project. Either they use it, or they know somebody who uses it and they really like it, or maybe it makes them really mad, but in a way that you can help them fix, which is also a total positive. Um, so yeah, uh, having really clear steps for how to get involved is the next part of that. So once they know that you're looking for people, don't make them search for how to get on your IRC channel or how to uh, fork your code or anything along those lines. Just make it really simple for people to get started. Again, that lowers the barrier to entry. Uh, for DreamWidth, we have our wiki, of course, which has all of our talks or all of our, um, our steps for what to do, how to get started. We actually have a getting started guide on there for various aspects of the project. And we also have a DreamWidth development training community. So for people who are new developers, they can go and look at that community and ask questions. They're really simple questions. Um, the perk about that is that then we're aware of where our gaps are. So we can go and update our documentation to fill those in. Having how-to guides is also really useful. So if there's one thing that everyone always trips on, take five minutes after you've explained it to the next person for the fifth time in a week and just stick it in the wiki, put a link to it in your how-to guide, and then it makes it a lot easier for you going forward to be able to reference that um, which helps you spend less time doing that part, but it also helps other people who are more self-starters be able to go and look and see how they need to do things. Um, checklists, same general concept, have like a one, two, three step list ready to, available to go. Um, and yeah, just continue lowering those barriers to entry. Um, excuse me just for one second. One of the big things that DreamWidth does that I really appreciate is we recognize that 14, year, 14 years of legacy Perl code is hard to install. It's really hard to install. It's extremely hard to compile. Half the time we can't get it working. <laughs> um, so we don't expect somebody who's brand new to development to do that. So we actually have a program called a DreamHack program, which is basically our code installed on one of our servers in a little virtual box that's kind of off to the side. Um, we host them, you hack on them. It's really simple. It requires extremely low barrier to entry. All you need to do is fill out a form. Um, the link for uh, the developer getting started uh, checklist is right there, and that has some information on how to get signed up for a dream hack. Um, and if you want to see how much that costs us to do, just see me after the presentation. Uh, we also do. I'll say right now, it costs us three hundred dollars a month, and we make it back fivefold. Three hundred dollars a month, and we make it back fivefold. Thanks, boss. Um, <laughs> So we also are doing our own DreamWidth specific Zero to Pearl community uh, for people who are really interested in getting involved with DreamWidth but might not have any idea even how to get started doing Pearl because that, that's also a pretty big barrier. Um, it's zero to pearl.dreamwith.org. Um, we are literally just starting this. I started typing this up on Tuesday. So um, it's, I'm really excited about it. I think it's gonna be a really great resource for our community in the future. And I strongly encourage you to do something for like for your project with that as well. Um, not only are we gonna be covering how to do Perl, we're also gonna be covering the specific things that you need to hack on DreamWith, how to start our workers, um, the way that we prefer things to be formatted, so on and so forth. So training your developers is a step that a lot of projects just sort of gloss over. Um, the Rockstar programmer is what people are theoretically looking for, but they're definitely the exception. Your average programmers, people who pretty much know what they're doing, kinda, sorta, maybe, are the people that are gonna be most interested in your project 99% of the time. So being able to train people is something that nonprofit organizations really understand at a base level. The training's built into the culture, and there's really clear career paths, so to speak, in a variety of directions. Traditionally, we think about career paths moving upwards, but with nonprofit organizations, not only are there ways to go up, there's also ways to go sideways, and also ways to step back. 
that are built into the culture so that if somebody all of a sudden has an attack of life and they can't finish this one thing that they've been working on, there's a way for them to gracefully step back and for somebody else to step in to pick up the slack. And having that embedded in their culture has been a lifesaver for so many of the organizations that I'm a part of. So with open source organizations, because we're not a traditional business, so to speak, well, most of the time anyway, there's a lot more flexibility. So take advantage of the fact that somebody might want to move from support into development. That's a sideways step, not up. Um, they might want to move from development into support. Again, that's a sideways step, not upwards. Um, they might want to move into more of a leadership position, maybe a team lead, or maybe they really don't want to be a team lead anymore and they want to go back to just being an occasional contributor. Being able to be flexible and allow for people to have that expansion and contraction within your organization is going to help retain people. So if somebody can't do what they've been doing for the last two years anymore, you don't lose them entirely, they just step back a little bit. And it allows them to do it gracefully without dropping things on the floor. So another thing that nonprofits do that I would really like to see more open source organizations do is invest in the community. Um, Girl Scouts do leadership, do leadership summits, so does the Society for Creative Anachronism. Uh, we'll have you know, an event once a year where it's all officers day. So you come if you want to learn how to deal with the accounting side of things, if you want to uh, learn how to be like the president of your local chapter or whatever, you can go and you can get like hands-on training for how to do that. Um, we really believe in training in DreamWith, as I'm sure you can tell. Uh, and our dedication to investing in the community is something that I haven't really seen in a lot of other smaller projects before. So we paid for 14 of our developers uh, and staff members to go to YAPSI, which is yet another Pearl conference this year. We paid for their airfare, we paid for their hotel room, and we paid for their conference fees. Um, this, is, this has totally energized our community. We've gotten so many pull requests in the last two weeks, and I guarantee that we're gonna see a consistent bump in the number of Pearl requests and the amount of patches and everything else that we've been seeing. We're gonna see that continue for a while, and it'll drop off after five or six months and then we're gonna do it again, and then we'll go back up. And uh, yeah, that, that's worked out really well for us. We did that last year. We saw that pattern, we're seeing it again this year. It just brings so much life and vitality to the community because it's a community building event. It brings our developers closer. It helps encourage people to get excited about the project again. Um, we'll also buy books. So if there's something that you've been wanting to learn that's relevant to our interest, we'll go buy you a book to do it if you can't afford to do it yourself. Um, so yeah, invest in your community so your community has something invested in you because that increases retention. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some of the stuff that open source projects might think when they're trying to deal with new people. So, oh, they don't know enough to be useful. Well, they'd know a lot more if you taught them and useful is definitely a relative term. So if a new person comes in and can identify gaps in your existing training regimen, I think that's useful. If they can point out things that you always just step over, if you're, they're pointing out that missing step in your procedures, I think that's useful because then you have an opportunity to fill in that gap. Um, another one is, I have more important things to do than to hold this person's hand and answer their questions. Um, well, let's just put it this way. Five minutes spent talking to a new developer now is gonna save you an hour down the road because they're gonna be able to continue to develop themselves and to become better and better and better and they're gonna be able to handle stuff that you don't have to deal with anymore. So that gives you the opportunity to deal with the stuff that's a little bit more tricky um, and even train them on how to deal with the stuff that's a little more tricky so you can concentrate on other things. So another thing we hear a lot is, well, if they have a question, they're gonna ask it. I don't need to go track them down to see if they have a question. Well, okay, so this one's kinda of hard because everyone likes to think that their organization is welcoming and opening and you know, really flexible and super friendly to newcomers. But if you think about the number of new people who've actually asked questions on your IRC channel or on your mailing list in the last six months to a year and think about the community reaction to those questions, have people been like super willing and happy to help them? Or has it been kind of like, oh, not again, and they just get ignored or even worse that they get ridiculed or talked down to? If that's the case, then you might want to reevaluate your community culture because you're probably not as welcoming as you think you are. And finally, uh, if they really wanted to learn, they would do it the way I did, carrying bits in an old bucket uphill both ways through a snowstorm on a 56K modem. <laughs> 56K. 
<laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yes, uphill both ways, both ways. So, okay, that might be how you learned. And if that's how you learned and it worked for you, I'm really happy for you. Because for most people, it's really difficult to self-start self and to learn in a vacuum. So maybe you had to do it that way because there wasn't anyone else around there to help you. But guess what? Your new volunteer has you. So you should you know, be that person. <laughs> so how do you work with a new developer? Uh, nonprofits have a too deep rule in most situations for a wide variety of reasons, most of which we're not going to cover here. But the two, ones, or the two that we need to talk about today are they provide accountability, and they also provide more than one resource for any one problem. Um, growstuff.org does pair programming, which I just, it blew my mind when I first heard about this. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. So I just lifted something directly from the wiki because I credit it right there so I can. <laughs> so Growstuff's run by Scud, uh, Alex Bailey, who keynoted yesterday. Pairing improves software quality in a variety of ways. It gives a second set of eyes to catch bugs earlier to make debugging easier. Um, one person can act as the other's conscience, reminding them to follow good programming practices. And while the other person is getting their hands dirty in the code, the other one can think strategically. Um, it also helps to share knowledge, and so that one person doesn't get this huge sense of, sense of code ownership, which can create possessive developers, which is a problem. So what can your newbie developer do? They can work on tiny bugs. There are tiny bugs that are always super annoying, but they might not be important enough for you to fix because you have 12 other things that you really need to get done, like last week. So do a cursory review of your, of your bug place. Bugzilla is what we use. So if the things look easy to fix, like adding white space or fixing copy or maybe adding something to a drop down or adding in a checkbox, mark it as effort minor or tag it as newbie developer bait. Um, Dreamwith also posts them to our uh, developer training community, which has been historically the bugs that get put into the newbie developer community get snapped up like within hours, like super, super fast. And they get done really quickly and then they're done. And then we commit the thing and then it's done and we don't have to deal with it again. And that one bug that's been driving me months for, or driving me nuts for six months is taken care of. And there was no senior development time taking it up for it or very minimal senior development time, and your new person gets to be able to say, look, I did that, that's a thing, that thing right there, that bug that I fixed, that is the thing that I did, and I'm just so proud of myself, because look, I fixed it, I fixed it, it's amazing. And you might think I'm being silly right now, but I've seen that, I've seen that in person. Last week, I saw that in person. They start bouncing, and they get really happy and smiley, and then they start hugging everyone, and it's just, it's all over after that. <laughs> So, the free. yeah, the first hit's <laughs> always free. Uh, so, letting them work on tiny bugs not only makes them feel really good about themselves, that also makes your project look really good because you're fixing the little stuff. And fixing the little stuff is an attention to detail type of thing that people who might be using your product might be looking for. Um, it also gives an opportunity, opportunity to demonstrate good practice, so to make sure that they're doing things the way you want them to do. And they'll say, yes! <laughs> I love this little baby guy, I don't know. <laughs> so crafting your community. So you might already have a community, but maybe you wanna change it a little bit. So look at your project's culture or what you want that culture to be to find out what you need to focus on. So the SCA needs people who are interested in history because we're a historical reenactment organization. Uh, Girl Scouts need people who can deal with girls, um, <laughs> uh, like small children or even less small children. And Dreamwith looks for people who understand accessibility first development practices. We encourage new developers to learn code with an eye towards accessibility. And we don't back engineer and we don't do things right, or we always do things right the first time. So those are the type of people that we try to attract to our project. So ways you can do that is be encouraging. Give credit where credit's due. So the Girl Scouts have merit badges for awesome stuff and Dreamwith puts your name in a news post. <laughs> and, uh, we also do code tours, which highlight the developer who worked on the patch, as well as explaining what the patch is. This facilitates user-developer interaction because it kind of helps people understand that, you know, maybe you haven't seen any huge changes recently, but no, we really have been working. Look, we did these 63, th 63 things last month, and you can go through and you can look at everything. Um, our users are really awesome in that a lot of times when we do a code tour, 
if they see a bug that they've been wanting fixed for a while, they'll actually go into comments and they'll say, oh my gosh, thank you so much for fixing this. This has been driving me nuts. And then that makes them more loyal to us, so we have more users. That makes our developer really happy because somebody just thanked them for all the hard work that they just did. And it's really a win-win situation. I strongly encourage you, if you have the ability to do code tours, sit down and do them. They're so much fun. Like, I really enjoy doing them personally, so. Um, other motivational tools can be bribery, like flat out bribery. Like, I'm not, that's not a euphemism, I promise. Um, but uh, at Yapsi, I painted nails and braided hair in exchange for people doing patches, and you would, would not believe how motivational that was for some of our guys. Um, <laughs> we, had, we had sparkly nails all over the place. Um, and Denise knit socks for people. Um, I've also been known to bake and send cookies to people who fix a bug that I really need fixed for support. Bribery totally works. I mean, that works for us. Uh, your mileage may vary just depending on your community, but you might want to give it a try because it's, <laughs> it's very, uh, well, it's a bribe. <laughs> so another thing that you can do to encourage your community is to be willing to write references. Um, writing references for open source projects, it might seem a little bit weird, but I can say that the last two regular jobs I've gotten, I've gotten partially based on the, the fact that I had a really good reference from DreamWeb. So more references equals more of our people getting jobs, which means a more healthier community because people have time to actually work on your project. Another thing you can do to help encourage your culture is to be a safe space. It's okay if failure happens. Everyone makes mistakes and you should be encouraging rather than critical. Um, and if you make the mistake, just don't be afraid to talk about it in public. Talk about it on your IRC channel, make a post saying this is what happened, you know. For example, Mark, who is uh, one of the co-owners of DreamWith, we had a database failure uh, about a month and a half ago, and he kind of maybe sort of forgot to restart Memcache, which meant that our services were really slow, and they were really slow for a month, and we couldn't figure out why. And then all of a sudden, we were at Yapsi, and Mark and Denise just sort of fell over laughing in the corner because Mark realized that he forgot to restart Memcache, and he did. We bought new hardware. We bought new hardware because the site was slow. <laughs> and um, yeah, so. I can see in a lot of cultures, people would be like, oh shoot, I forgot to restart Memcache, don't, uh, they don't, won't tell anybody, they'll just restart it and oh my gosh, look, the site's magically faster, I wonder how that happened. <laughs> um, or they might get ridiculed if they talk about it in public, oh my gosh, I can't believe you forgot to restart Memcache, what's wrong with you? Dream with? Um, we said, aw, Mark, aw, shucks, maybe you don't do that again. Okay, here's a pony, actually it was a unicorn. Um, that we gave him, it was pink and purple and sparkly and sat on his shoulder for the rest of the trip because it's the I forgot to restart Memcache pony. <laughs> so, <laughs> and again, that's our development culture, that's our community, that might not work for you, but totally worked for us. And I did check with him before I put this into the slides, so um, that's another thing if you're gonna embarrass people in public, maybe make sure that it's okay first. So the next thing I wanna talk about is Rockstar programmer culture. And this is from Randomling, who is one of my favorite volunteers uh, to work with. And she's also one of our newer volunteers, and she's also one of our most prolific. So I'm going to read this for the people on the uh, television over there. Hi. So I was just arguing with someone this morning about a blog post which was all, computer science should be as hard as possible so that all your graduates feel super, super elite. I always feel like I have nothing to contribute because I'm not a super genius elite programmer who knows everything. And then I have to come back here in IRC and ask to be reassured. I get about three paragraphs in, which is enough for clearly I do not belong in your world, and then I close the tab in horror. So like I said, Randomling is one of our newer developers and one of our more active volunteers, and that previous exchange made me see red. I was furious. There is no reason why anybody should ever feel that they are not good enough to work on a project, why they should feel that their skills, that they have worked incredibly hard to develop, aren't good enough, ever. So if you're not as protective as I am of your volunteers, then you really need to reevaluate what you're doing. I'm sorry, I get a little angry about that. Okay, let's move on to <laughs> more cat pictures. Okay, um, so managing your community is Something, again, that's really difficult for a lot of projects, maybe because you don't have somebody who's really good at it. Um, 
So find somebody who's good at it. Um, and make sure that you're enforcing your community standards once you've established what they are. You want to make sure that the people who are really toxic to your environment don't stick around. Those are the only people that you can't make room for, are the people who aren't being productive and aren't being conducive to a welcoming spirit. So on that note, let's talk about imposter syndrome. On the team for three years, still nervous about tryouts. So imposter syndrome is the constant feeling that any minute everyone around you is going to find out that you're faking it. I've been dealing with that all week. So this can make even the most experienced developers question their coding abilities. Has anyone ever felt like this? Can I get a show of hands? Uh, yeah, that's pretty much everyone. So keeping an eye out for this in your community is a really good way to sort of make sure this doesn't happen as much. Um, encouragement and positive reinforcement can really help. Um, so if somebody submits a little patch, say, hey, thank you so much. I appreciate that you spent the time fixing this bug. I appreciate the time that you spent making this new feature. Maybe it's not something you're ever going to use, but saying that you appreciate the fact that they did it is going to go leaps and bounds. Um, the other thing that you can do as far as your community management goes is keep an eye out for negative self-talk. So if somebody's saying, I suck, I'm not good at this, I can't do this, I give up, just talk to them, find out what's going on. Make sure that you know, they're okay, that they understand that it's okay if you fail. It's okay if you can't figure this out because we appreciate you anyway. Um, me personally, I threaten to send overly cheerful Avengers pictures to people. Um, that works a lot more than you think it might. So the next thing you should do is be understanding of other commitments. Um, there is this quote from the Columbia Spectator uh, that was, it just, it really struck me saying, uh, Aaron says masochism is the perfect way to describe the culture in computer science, pushing yourself to the extreme and getting awesome stuff done. People have other things to do in their lives than to work on your project. And when things stop being fun, they're going to start resenting your project. They're going to find other things to do that are more fun. And it's going to start building frustration. So keep an eye out for people saying, oh, I can't do this. I give up. Or, oh, this is driving me nuts. And check in with them. I mean, if you just check in with them to see, hey, what's going on? What can I help you with? What are you stuck on? Can you explain to me? What, what your process is here. Sometimes even just the act of explaining what's going on can help them click over and say, oh yeah, I forgot to install MySQL or something along those lines. So another thing to do is to know your... Uh, <laughs> Go ahead, you can say that. Yeah, so uh, Denise was trying to install our code base last night on her computer. Um, she is one of our owners and she couldn't do it because she forgot to install MySQL. So um, yeah, anyway. Uh, so something to do is if you notice somebody's behavior has changed drastically, like if they're usually on IRC and pretty chatty and then all of a sudden they're not talking anymore, or if they're one of your more consistent contributors and all of a sudden you're not getting any pull requests from them, just drop them an email or send them a PM and say, hey, are you okay? Is there anything I can do to help? Um, sometimes people have attacks of life and it's really important to value consistency but also understand that there's life outside of the internet, which I know is really hard to understand, but it's okay, it's okay, it happens. So other ways that you can be understanding of people's commitments outside of life is to do stuff in iterations. Again, this is something that GrowStuff does that I think is absolutely fascinating. Um, they do their development cycles in two week intervals. So you can sign on for two weeks, that's it. That's the maximum commitment. And if you need to drop out for this iteration and the next iteration, but you want to jump in the one after that, there's no pressure, there's no shame for saying, hey, I just had something come up and I couldn't dedicate the time. Um, nonprofit organizations have enforced cycles of leadership, which works really well because it helps prevent burnout, and that's exactly what doing iterations does. And again, that doesn't work for everyone. Dreamwith doesn't do that, um, but GrowStuff does, and it's, I can see it's working really well for them. So it takes all kinds. Um, not everyone who wants to be involved with your project is going to be interested in doing development. I know, I know. So that's OK. <laughs> These people can still be valuable contributors to your community. Cheerleaders can come in and say, hey, thank you so much for fixing that. I appreciate that you fixed that bug. Or, yeah, you can totally uh, do template toolkits on everything. Yeah, you can totally do that thing. Um, and just being really encouraging and having a positive environment makes developing a lot easier. 
Uh, documentation is something that non-developers can do. You've got end user documentation, uh, project documentation, so culture, um, pretty much anything. Um, as long as you can sort of kind of explain to a non-developer sort of what's going on here, usually they can take the reins and run with it. And end user support, that's what I do. Um, end user support is something that a lot of developers aren't super good at, uh, just because they have other things that they wanna be doing. They would rather be coding than dealing with people. And yeah, I'll totally do that for you. I mean, I'm happy to go and talk to your users and tell them why we can't do X, Y, and Z, and why isn't this working, and interface between the users and the developers. Um, and end user support is totally a gateway drug to development. So if you really do need more developers, let people start doing your support. They will eventually move over to doing dev. So let's recap. So be nice and learn how to manage and nurture your people. Lower your entry barriers, mentor your developers, establish your project specific goals, and ensure the long-term survival of your project. Yay! So how can I do this in my project? Define your structure. Um, so this is the biggest lesson that open source projects can learn from nonprofits. Nonprofits, by definition, have a defined structure that is defined by law. They have things that they have to do, ways that they have to do it. Um, they have to define their scope. They need to get certain things approved before they can even get started. And having that structure uh, gives them a framework to operate within. A lot of open source projects don't have that structure. They might develop it later, but if you're still pretty new and pretty early on in your development structure, then just take a couple minutes, a couple hours, a couple days, figure out exactly what the framework is that you wanna operate within. So this is the thing that uh, made me rewrite my entire talk um, and pretty much rework everything from the bottom up. Somebody asked me how they could replicate dream what success with having a welcoming developer culture. And my first reaction was, well, you'd have to clone Mark and Denise, and we can't start another open source project to do that. And then I started thinking, well, wait. You don't have to clone Mark and Denise, although that might be beneficial, but you don't have to. What you need to do is figure out what your guiding principles are. You need to figure out the things that are important to you and your project as a culture. Uh, DreamWidth has our guiding principle statement up at this website. I very strongly recommend you go and read it. I'm going to do a really surface level overview here. We uh, promote open access to your data, interoperability with other sites, open source, and we even say right in there, we will work with a community of volunteer developers and encourage and nurture the volunteer development process. That is in one of the first pieces that came out of us announcing the DreamWidth project. That was right there, like first day. Um, community review of processes, respecting privacy, transparency, freedom of expression, respecting the dignity of all human beings, and no advertising. True facts. We had a business plan before DreamWith was even a glimmer in Denise and Mark's eye. We had a business plan in like, what, 2004 or something. <laughs> we didn't... The business plan was written down in 2008. Oh, sorry. The business plan was written down in 2008, but it was in your head in 2004. Okay, so having that plan available kind of gives us a structure. Um, we also had our diversity statement available very early on to help define what our community culture was going to be. So with these things in place, our volunteer culture was a natural fit. We attracted the kind of people that we wanted to work on the project. So trying to tack this on to an existing project requires a fair amount of community buy-in. Um, there's probably going to be some pushback, but it's for the greater health of the project overall. So the two easiest places to start are being welcoming. So start changing your culture from within to allow new people to get to join in, lower your entry barriers, take those little small steps to sort of figure out where your process is broken. The second thing is craft a guiding principle statement. It's gonna provide focus for the things that you want your community to be. And it's gonna take a lot longer to do than to just tell people to stop being jerks in IRC. But it's arguably more useful long-term because it provides a longer-term trajectory forward. So the end. Be patient, ask for help if you need it, and when in doubt, consult your references. Birthday Hat Hedgehog says, thanks for listening. I'm going to put the notes from my slides, so the extended version, up on misscat.dreamwith.org. And the slides will be available on slideshare.net slash dreamwith. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Thank you so much. First, thank you so much for this talk. You're welcome. Um, So what do you want, huh? First up, uh, 
We got socks. We got socks. We got socks. Okay, actually, <laughs> I mean, there. Sorry, let me just uh, rephrase that really quick. So, how do you balance the uh, the difference between an expectation-driven culture where I do this, I get a cookie, with the intrinsically motivated, I want to do this, and I will also get a cookie? Type. Does that make sense? Is that what you were asking? Why don't you go ahead and answer that? And then we'll okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, from a surface point of view, um, an extrinsically motivated, I'm going to go after the cookie type of development process, it's still going to get stuff done. Um, I personally feel that if you have a community that's invested in your project and believes in what your project believes in, that won't happen, or at least it won't happen as much. Um, but on the other hand, if there's a, something that nobody really wants to do but it really needs to get done, having that extrinsic motivator to sort of get them started down that path can definitely be really useful. Um, I would say that the bulk of your, in a healthy community, the bulk of your developers should be intrinsically motivated and want to do stuff because they want to do stuff because it gives them pleasure within themselves. Okay. Okay. So, so the follow up to just like clarify one thing. Uh huh. Um, obviously, like you, you wouldn't be bribing everyone for every task. I'd like to, but no, we don't bribe everyone for every task. <laughs> Um, it kind of depends. Uh, generally, I'll wait till somebody's been involved with our project for maybe a couple patches before I'll start nudging them in a direction of something that I want them to do, cookie or not. Um, it just kind of gives them a chance to sort of get their feet under them. I have been known to tell people that if they start developing for DreamWit that I'll come over and cook them dinner, which I have done, actually. Um, <laughs> for one of my friends, not for like some random person off the internet. Sorry, Dad, don't listen to that part. Um, <laughs> So, but um, I try to not do it for every single patch. Um, if it's something that I really need done, because I'm not a developer, I don't code. Um, I am pretty much, I don't code yet because I'm a worthwhile and valuable human being in contribution to the project. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're working on it. Um, so if I need something done for support because it's a bug that's really been bothering a lot of my users and making my life more difficult, I'm totally not above saying, I will paint your nails at the next conference we're at. Please go fix this bug. I'm not above doing that. But I try not to do it as like a general, everybody who does this gets bugs fixed. That being said, um, occasionally, like once every eight to 10 months or so, uh, we have little user picture icons on our site. And part of our site culture is that uh, people will have unique icons for different feelings or emotions or different tasks that they're doing on the site. Um, and very occasionally, I will put out an all call to all of our volunteers and say, hey, if you're a volunteer with DreamWith, if you self-identify as a DreamWith volunteer, come leave a note on this entry that I've made, and I will go make you a super cool icon. It'll be just the same as everyone else's icon. But that's more of a community building thing rather than a bribery thing. But I totally take that as a bribery thing. So, Thank you. Yes? Do you want to do you want to talk on the mic so people can hear? Uh, we do. I don't know either. I don't even know how it turns on. Um, and it's turned. Hold on. Okay. Here. Do you want to come up here? And just come around over the side. Okay. So one minute left for the session. Um, um, I yeah. was a volunteer at OMSI, and. The, you, they go through training, like most places do. But the moment you get your badge after training, you get access to everything in OMSI. And you're supposed to go to all the shows and everything. So you talk it up to get more people in there. And if um, after so many volunteer hours, you get a family pass. So you can bring your whole family in whenever you want. And that is such a great incentive. Um, to get people in, and then the once a year big party. Since you've been talking about this, I thought I'd throw out what OMSI does, because 
it's great that we learn from each other and co build up the different cultures. Yeah, I think definitely building up different cultures and having a contributory, contrib a, an environment that is contributed to is very valuable. <laughs> Um, something else that DreamWith does that's sort of like a bribery thing uh, for certain things like styles. Um, each journal can be styled uniquely on its own um, and we try to have as many different styles as possible. That's a lot of work and so we will occasionally, uh, I don't know, bribe people, pay off our styles people with points for the site that they can use for services on the site. Um, yeah, any other questions? Yeah. I want to say it's in the wiki somewhere. Um, we probably should start talking about that a lot more often. I personally talk about how Denise writes amazing references to like everybody who will listen to me because I've seen some of those reference letters. Yeah, so within the community we advertise uh, that we write references. It should be though. But here's the thing. If you're putting in that much time and that much effort into an open source project and you have your GitHub little repository thingy where you can show off the things that you've done, why wouldn't you want to write a reference for the volunteer? That's a perfect incentive. And maybe they're only joining your project so that they can get the reference, but you know what? You're still getting code out of it. And if they keep doing it for long enough, they might become invested in your community. That's a general net positive. Denise. The other fun thing to do when you're writing references for people is to be evil and make them write the first draft. Yes, make them write the first draft and then, the, then you edit it to write the reference because that helps combat imposter syndrome. If you ever do that to me, I don't know what I'm going to do, but it's not going to be pleasant, so please don't. <laughs> because uh, it makes the person who you're writing a reference for, it makes them pull out what they think they've done that's like worthy of uh, being put into this reference. And it also means that you have all the information right there at your fingertips. And then you take it and you make it even more better because people are going to downplay their achievements constantly and stuff. So you make them write their reference so that it saves you time because you don't have to go track down everything that they've done. It also is just a good practice. Anybody else? Anything else? I have lots of things to talk about. Yeah, we're out of time. Okay. Bye, guys.